For this last segment, we're going to talk about emerging concepts and combination strategies for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. So Brad, why don't you start us off with a little bit of the rationale for using immunotherapies in combination in renal cell carcinoma. So when we look at this, I mean, there's obviously been a lot of trials that have looked at combining more to immunotherapy. So we have Checkmate 214 using ipilimumab with nivolumab, idea of using that CTLA-4 to sort of enrich the T-cell population and then sort of turn them on, if you will, with the PD-1 blockade. And then we've had now multiple of phase one and phase two trials already finished accrual looking at combinations of VEGF or in TKIs with immunotherapy. And you could sort of simplistically think of that, well, maybe I'm just sort of killing the tumor cells to maybe enrich the immune response. But I think there's probably a lot more to it than just that. I mean, there's been data by Dave McDermott that shows that you know, these VEGF therapies are really doing more to the actual immune environment, changing the Treg environment, and sort of enriching the cells for a better immune response. So clearly, you know, it's a synergistic effect when you start combining these drugs together. So I think that's one of the really kind of interesting things now is, is thinking about ways to kind of create not just a little bit of additive effect, but a synergistic effect. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you're right. I, th I think mechanistically it's going to be hard to say we fully understand, you know, these patterns. But, but I, you know, and I think we're going to have to be careful to look at toxicity because uh, what we don't want to see is sy synergy on the toxicity side as well. Um, but what's nice about some of these really disparate mechanisms is that they may have the opportunity to kind of uh, play off of each other from an efficacy standpoint without necessarily really overlapping toxicity too much. Great. Nick, do you want to tell us about the yeah. Invigor 151? That was one of, I think, the highlights here yeah. Yeah. at uh, GU ASCO 2018. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one that I think, you know, we're going to be looking towards, you know, where that's leading into the field. Well, we've covered... We've covered Nevo Ipi. I just want to make certain everybody's got that pretty clear in mind. That that's the first one out of the block, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's set a new standard. Yeah. I, I think yeah. we're going to all look forward to it. I'm not sure I'm going to know how to give Ipi because I don't give Ipi, uh, but uh, I'm going to have to learn. I think. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did participate uh, pretty heavily in the uh, development of the. Um, a value or a tizolizumab and uh, a vastin or bevacizumab trial. Uh, we did the phase randomized phase two, where um, uh, a tezo uh, actually beat sunitinib, not by a lot, but but it didn't. It wasn't inferior. And then in uh, the subset of patients, uh, the um, a tezo, a, a vastin or bevacizumab, excuse me. Um, was quite good, about 14 months, and it was in the PDL one positive patients. Mm -hmm. So that randomized phase two, we've heard that presented uh, by Mike Atkins last year at ESCO. Um, and uh, there, Bob Mozer, uh, again, Bob, uh, Iron Man Bob, um, uh, presented another uh, randomized phase three, uh, this time of uh, Atezo and, and uh, Avastin or Bevacizumab. Uh, with uh, sunitinib. And the, the results were, I think, uh, powered for uh, the PDL1 positive patients. Based on that phase two data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it made it was, sense based yeah, on what it, we saw. Oh, it's perfectly logical. We should, we should look at in the phase three right. and that's in that right. group. So it was, and, and it was a low bar. It was greater than 1% or something like that. Um, and, and the results, I think, were, uh, I've got them here, it's seven... Uh, PFS was 7.7 months for sunitinib and 11.2 months for uh, the Atezo Bev. Mm -hmm. It's all right. You know, the hazard ratio was 0.075, p value 0.02, toxicities uh, were not significantly different. In fact, maybe a little better mm -hmm. uh, with the double combination. Uh, and uh, the duration response was pretty respectable, not even reached yet in the, uh, in the Dublin arm. Um, and the objective response rate was about 43%. Um, so I think as we see these data uh, presented and, and analyzed, that's a reasonable uh, immuno-VEGF uh, combination. It's certainly well tolerated. It's uh, IV every three weeks, convenient. Uh, from the patient perspective, probably a bit pricey, uh, but uh, it avoids the whole issue of TKI toxicities. So I think it's a reasonable 
contender uh, against the Nevo Ippi. Mm -hmm. Now I'll let you guys tell me whether, because I don't have any experience with Nevo Ippi, uh, but I'll let you guys tell me what you think this, how this stacks up against Nevo Ippi. Um, if we just look at the, I, was, uh, I just heard you talking about progression free survival of 11.4 months and uh, the response rates of 43%. I don't find them very different from the uh, population in intermediate and poor risk population or intention to treat population in the EP Nevo Checkmate 214 trial. No. If you look at just comp across the trial comparison, again, with the caveat of different patient population, right. possibility yeah. of happening that, I see that uh, progression-free survival and overall objective responses fairly comparable. But right. that was in a PDL one positive Yeah, but the population. IIT was very similar, I think, Dan. The, the, I, I've got the IIT here. Yeah. IIT included all comers, and it was 8.4 for sudentinib and 11.2 for a Tezobev, p-value was identical, 0.02. Objective response rate, very similar. Mm -hmm. So I think they, they powered it for the pd one positive, but the IIT was spot on in the same po population. I think it's also impressive, even though the response rate was 35-36%, uh, there still was a 15% CR rate in the patients mm -hmm. who were pd one positive received the combination. Mm -hmm. So I think that's Correct. also, uh, yeah. it's interesting. That's now back to pd one testing again. So, so it's a contender. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And certainly every three weeks with two drugs that most medical oncologists are pretty comfortable with makes, makes it a reasonable option. So okay. I would be curious to see uh, the uses of steroids, corticosteroids in this trial. Was a use of corticosteroids in the mm -hmm. EP Nevo trial was 60, close to 60%. 60 yeah. yeah, I don't. I think and they presented that. Let me let me check that out. I thought I had the data so, here. Uh, it wasn't very high. I, I, I think it was a very well tolerated regimen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, I think, I think, I think that's good yeah. to know for the community, right? Yeah. I mean, right. because mm -hmm. when we look into the real world experience with our patients, frequently we see toxicities are are, are harder than what we see in the clinical trials reported. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, I think they saw a little bit more hypertension, obviously because of the uh, vast and aspect, but again, I think it was mostly grade one, grade two. So mm -hmm. again, again, we've been learning how to take care of hypertension too. Mm -hmm. But definitely a new option mm -hmm. and a very valid option.